Hello dear students, in this video, let's talk about gastritis, right? So when we are speaking of gastritis, what is gastritis? So what is gastritis? It's a simple thing. What is it? It's an inflammation of gastric mucosa, all of you know, right? So when it's an inflammation of gastric mucosa, the first thing comes to us is types of gastritis. What is that? Types of gastritis. So what are the types of gastritis we have? So let's start off with the first type of gastritis. We call it as acute gastritis. What is that called as? Acute gastritis. Right? So when we are speaking of acute gastritis, my dear students, so let's go along with the first, let's finish off the acute gastritis, then we'll go to the other types of gastritis. So when we are speaking of <coughs> acute gastritis, so remember my dear students, acute gastritis, what can cause? So it is a sudden onset, right? It is a sudden onset. Okay, so if it is a sudden onset, what is the cause of this particular gastritis? Most common causes are very, very important. That is your NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can lead to <coughs> acute gastritis. Apart from that, the next important thing is the large amount of alcohol. Yes, alcohol can also lead to what is that? acute gastritis and also even sometimes your coffee also right so these are the type and these are the few risk factors which can lead to acute gastritis okay now the risk of developing acute gastritis can go increased as a result of helicobacter pylori acid okay so now when we are speaking of acute gastritis so what happens to the patient so the patient's clinical features of acute gastritis, okay? So the patient comes to you, whenever there is an acute gastritis, there is an erosion of the gastric mucosa. So, but not just the erosion, but also remember, so not just the erosion, rather there will be damage to the small blood vessel and there can be bleeding in the stomach, which can present as a hematemesis. What is that? Hematemesis. What is hematemesis? Hematemesis is nothing but... The blood in the vomiting. Hematemesis is nothing but blood in the vomiting. And also patient can present with melena. Okay. So what is melena? So the dark black tarry stool. Remember this word? Black tarry stool. Why? Because it is a type of upper GI bleeding. Upper GI bleeding. By the time the blood passes from the stomach to the stools, what will happen? The RBC will get, get destroyed and it will form a pigment called as a Hemazoin. What is the name of the pigment? Hemazoin. Okay. So hemazoin are also called as a acid hematin. Acid hematin. So this is the reason because of which the stools are black in color. When we are speaking of which disease, that is melena as a clinical feature. So melena can come as a result of any of the upper GI bleedings. Okay. So such as for example, malary tear, esophageal varicel bleeding, all of them can present to you with that. Melina. Apart from that, patient will have, of course, epigastric pain. What is that? Epigastric pain. Okay. And also patient can have the two important symptoms. That is one of them can be nausea. So it is a very non-specific symptom. And also patient can have vomiting, which I already told you people, vomiting will occur and the blood can be present. Right. So if we are looking at a patient with acute gastritis, sir, what is the management for acute gastritis? Remember, management, the most important management, the first and most important, if there is a loss of blood is very high, if there is a hematemesis is very high, lots of amount of blood has been lost. So during that time, we go for IV fluids. Of course, IV fluids is a very, very important thing. Okay. After followed by the IV fluids, along with that, you are going to give conservative management. What is that? Conservative treatment. What is a conservative management which you can give to a patient? Of course, conservative management such as proton pump inhibitors and at the same time, most importantly, remove the risk factor. What is causing the gastritis? Such as, for example, alcohol, NSAIDs, all these things can cause the gastritis. So, remove the risk. Remove the risk factor. So, this is the story of your management of acute gastritis. But the problem comes to us, if the bleeding stops, well and good, everything, no problem. If bleeding does not stop, if bleeding does not stop, means if the bleeding persists, if the hematemesis will continue again and again, blood with vomiting, bloody vomiting is happening, black color stools is occurring, then what to do? So if bleeding does not stop, 
then what to do? So if bleeding does not stop, so what you are supposed to do? You are not supposed to leave the patient like that. If you leave the patient like that, patient will die of hypovolemia. So what you are supposed to do then? Then you take the patient and you are going to do a endoscopy. What is that? Endoscopy. Okay, so when you do an endoscopy, what you are going to find out basically where exactly is the blood coming from? See, basically what I told you, there is a bleeding which is occurring as a result of damage to the blood vessel. As a result of damage to the blood vessel, as a result of damage to the blood vessel, bleeding is continuously happening. So you do an endoscopy. In the endoscopy, what can happen? If you are lucky enough, our patient is lucky enough, you can find the bleeding vessel. If bleeding vessel found, if bleeding vessel found then what you are supposed to do you are supposed to do is that whichever the blood vessel so what is the basic rule says that wherever bleeding is there stop the bleeding simple as that right so if bleeding vessel is found then what you are supposed to do you are already you are using endoscopy so you can go for endoscopic diathermy what is that endoscopic diathermy so you can go for endoscopic diathermy me if not endoscopic diathermy with the endoscope only you can go for endoscopic adrenaline injection because adrenaline is a vasoconstrictor which will stop the bleeding or you can even go for endoscopic sclerotherapy what is that endoscopic sclerotherapy which basically will stop the bleeding so if vessel is formed but if at all, if the vessel is not found, what to do then? Yes, very importantly. So if vessel is found, patient is lucky enough, very good. If not found, if vessel, whichever the vessel, bleeding, that is not found. If the bleeding vessel is not found, then what to do? Then you are supposed to do one simple thing. What is that? You are supposed to find out the blood vessel. You, you didn't find. So you took the camera, you went into the stomach, you are looking for the blood vessel which is bleeding. You did not find it. If you did not find it, then the question, the question is what to do next so you need to find somehow how do you locate a blood vessel if it is bleeding you are going to go for angiogram you are going to go for angiogram in the angiogram you are going to find what is that whichever the blood vessel is bleeding now the question is that what is an angiogram angiogram is basically a contrast method which is used for the visualization of blood vessel it is a contrast based investigation used for the visualization of blood vessel. So you do an angiogram, then you find the vessel. During the angiogram, you can find the vessel, of course. So you can have a question now. Some of you are thinking, sir, what if uh, angiogram does not find the blood vessel? Angiogram will find the blood vessel because the whenever you inject the contrast, wherever bleeding is coming out, contrast will also come out. Definitely you will find out which blood vessel is bleeding. Find the vessel, angiogram and found the vessel. After finding the vessel, you go for angioembolization. Angioembolization. So basically, you are closing the blood vessel using a artificial embolization method. Such as for example, you can use coil. You can use coil method. Basically, you are going to keep a metallic coil and stop the bleeding. Or, for example, you can go for something like, uh, what is that? That is a human dura matter can also be used. Human dura matter also can be used. Okay. So, these are some methods for doing what is that? Angioembolization. So this is how you are supposed to manage the patient with a blood loss, patient with a blood loss if in the gastritis patient. So that is your acute gastritis, my dear students. So once we understood about the acute gastritis, let's go to the next important concept called as chronic gastritis. What is that? Chronic gastritis. So chronic gastritis, again, it is a very, very important topic. And most of the students leave out this topic for their exams. I don't know why it is so easy. Chronic gastritis can be divided into types. So what are the types of chronic gastritis? We have something called as, so in the second one, we have something called as type A gastritis. What is that, my dear students? Type very good type A gastritis. What is type A gastritis? Type A gastritis is also called as a atrophic gastritis. It's also called as atrophic gastritis. So this atrophic gastritis can also be called as, what is that also be called as? Autoimmune gastritis. What is that? Autoimmune gastritis. So what exactly happens in a chronic gastritis? What exactly happens here is that there are some autoantibodies. There are some autoantibodies to what? To the parietal cell. Very important point to be remembered. Autoantibodies to the parietal cells. Autoantibodies to the parietal cells are present. If autoantibodies are present to a parietal cell, now what will happen? So parietal cells, antibodies, 
destroy the parental cell antibodies what do they do destroy the parental cell very nice if parental cells are destroyed what will happen let's see right so let's understand from physiology we know the function of parental cell what is the function of parental cell parental cells are responsible for the production of your hydrochloric acid so if parental cells are destroyed so the first thing what you can notice is a decrease of stomach acid that is a hydrochloric acid and also if antibodies if antibodies are destroyed with cell parental cell if parental cells are destroyed then remember my dear students uh, the next thing what can also happen parental cells one more function is yes, uh, there is a production of some factor called as intrinsic factor Remember, intrinsic factor is produced by your parental cell. So, there is a decrease of intrinsic factor. There is a decrease of intrinsic factor. So, if there is a decrease of intrinsic factor, then what will happen? Let's see. So, there is a decrease of intrinsic factor. If there is a decrease of intrinsic factor, automatically the question comes to us is what? Yes, there is a decrease of intrinsic factor. So, because of which, what will happen? What is the function of intrinsic factor? Yes, the, remember from physiology once again, intrinsic factor is responsible for the absorption of one vitamin. What is that? vitamin b12 now if intrinsic factor is not there vitamin b12 absorption will be reduced so what will happen so reduced b12 absorption reduced b12 absorption why because remember b12 whenever you take it through the food okay b12 goes into the stomach that can be normally destroyed by your acid but from the destruction, who will prevent? Yes, the B12 destruction is prevented by your GSSS. So, is that intrinsic factor? So, there is a decrease of B12 absorption. If there is a decrease of B12 absorption, automatically, all of you know, it will lead to an anemia, megaloblastic anemia called as pernicious anemia. What is that called as? Pernicious anemia. Okay, all right. So, if there is a decrease of stomach acid, what do we call it as? We call it as a Echlorhydria. What do we call it as? Echlorhydria. What do we call it as? Echlorhydria. So, if there is a echlorhydria, basically there is a reduction of acid. So, will your body keep quiet? No, it won't keep quiet. What will your body do? It will try to compensate by doing what? By increasing a hormone called as a gastrin. What is the name of the hormone? Gastrin. So, automatically your body will increase the gastrin level. So, leading to hypergastrinemia. What is that? Hypergastrinemia. Okay. So, the question comes to us is, what is that? So, this has been a, a very important MCQ for many competitive exams as well. So, remember for a, like, you know, for all the exams, not just the need for all other also like FMG exam as well. For all of our exams, they ask one question. What is the most common cause of hypergastrinemia? So, most common cause of hypergastrinemia is atrophic gastritis which is also called as autoimmune or also called as type A gastritis. Okay. So, for this patient, what exactly we are supposed to do? So, to understand this, so we are supposed to treat the pernicious anemia as well and also your gastritis. So, basically, there is no permanent cure for this. No permanent cure. There is no permanent cure. So, if there is no permanent cure, what is the treatment? You are supposed to give B12 supplements. Yes, my dear students, B12 supplements. Along with B12 supplements, the next thing you are supposed to do is iron supplements. Okay. So, B12 supplement and iron supplements are given. In some cases, to suppress the activity of autoantibodies, we can consider steroids. We can consider what is that? Steroids. And pernicious anemia, my dear students. Remember, pernicious anemia is a type of anemia which is caused by lack of B12, which is due to what? Yes, that is due to B12, B12 absorption impairment. So, when we are giving a B12 supplement, the question comes to us, how will you give? This is a trap. Any any students can fall into B12 supplement, B12 supplement, B12, 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 everyone by academic. Exactly. The question comes to us, how will you give B12? Right? So, how will we give B12, my dear students? How we are going to give is, always it is paraenteral. Paraenteral. Why paraenteral? Because if you give B12 through the GIT, it will not get absorbed because of lack of which factor? Intrinsic factor. Because of lack of which factor? Intrinsic factor, my dear students. So, this is the story of your chronic gastritis that is type A. There is one more type of gastritis called as a type B gastritis. What is that? 
type B gastritis. So when we are speaking of type B gastritis, type B gastritis is usually caused by Helicobacter pylori. It is caused by which bacteria? Helicobacter pylori. Okay, so that is why I, we can remember it as B for bacterial gastritis. So, Helicobacter pylori causes gastritis along with the gastritis, it can increase the risk of ulcer actually. Okay, so how exactly Helicobacter pylori works, let's understand. So, when we are looking at a Helicobacter pylori, so Helicobacter pylori is a type of microorganism which has a property, something called as urease positive. It is having what is that? Urease positive, urease positive. So, urease positive, this is a virulence factor of this bacteria. Virulence factor means the damaging part of the bacteria. One of the damaging factor, the first factor is urease positive. So, if urease positive, what will happen? Let's see. So, whenever in the stomach or anywhere, if urea is there, right? So, urea will be broken down into ammonia. Ammonia. Okay, urea will be broken down into ammonia by urease. So, what is the problem here? So, what will ammonia do? So, ammonia naturally it is a alkaline in nature. It's type of alkaline in nature. What is that? Alkaline in nature. Okay, so if it is alkaline in nature, now where exactly the this content has been formed? Exactly in the stomach. Why stomach? Now let me give you answer. Helicobacter resides where exactly? Yes, resides in the antrum of the stomach. Resides in the antrum of the stomach. The most common site and favorite site for Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori will go and he will sit inside the antrum like this. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Slowly I will play the game with you. So what is the game he is playing? The game is urease is positive. <coughs> okay. So, now ammonia. Ammonia is an alkaline substance. Automatically, it will neutralize. It will neutralize what? Yes, it will neutralize the stomach acid. Yes, so, stomach acid, if it is neutralized, automatically what will happen? There is a decrease of hydrochloric acid. Okay. So, if hydrochloric acid is decreased, again, yes, remember what is there? Yes, what will be there? So, there is an increased level of gastrin. Earlier, I told you people, whenever there is a echlorhydria, there is a lack of hydrochloric acid, automatically gastrin level will increase. But what is the difference between atrophic and bacterial gastritis? This is the point. Atrophic gastritis, parietal cells itself are destroyed. But here, parietal cells are normal. The problem is urease. Okay, so this is a key point. So if gastrin is increased, automatically gastrin will go and stimulate which cells? Parietal cell. Okay, if gastrin will stimulate the parietal cells, then what will happen? So parietal cells, if they are, they will stimulate the parietal cell, means they will increase the acid production. Now a lot of acid has been produced. If acid has been produced, will it damage the stomach? No, as long as the stomach's mucus barrier is fine, so there is no destruction to stomach. So now this more acid goes to duodenum. More acid goes to duodenum. So, automatically, if it more as goes to duodenum, it will lead to, my dear student, a peptic ulcer disease of which organ? Of the duodenum, okay? So, duodenal ulcer, duodenal ulcer is caused by which bacteria? Helicobacter pylori because of which virulent factor? Yes, the virulence factor is your urease enzyme, okay? So, peptic ulcer of the duodenum by helicobacter pylori is caused as a result of urease, okay? All right. So, one virulence factor we have discussed. Then, let's go to the second virulence factor. This bacteria also produces toxins, my dear students. This bacteria also produces what? Toxins. So, what are the toxins it will produce? It will produce some toxin called as CAC A. It will produce toxin called as CAC A and also it will produce something called as VAC A. So, these are the two vaccines, uh, sorry, two toxins. Uh, so, these two toxins, my dear students, whatever is produced by the helicobacter pylori, now what will happen? They destroy, they destroy whom? Yes, uh, destroy gastric mucosa. They destroy what? Gastric mucosa. If gastric mucosa is destroyed, automatically they can lead to stomach ulcer. So, helicobacter pylori can cause, what is that? Yes, it can cause the ulcer in the stomach as well as in the duodenum. This is a very important point to be remembered. Now, once we understood about the ulcers, let's go to the next important point, the diagnosis of helicobacter pylori. 
diagnosis of helicobacter pylori so how will we diagnose so basically we are going to do upper gi endoscopy upper gi endoscopy so remember one fact upper gi endoscopy reaches till where you cannot just keep pushing the endoscope into the GI. It reaches up till second part of the duodenum. You are not supposed to push the endoscope beyond this region. Okay. So, once it reaches the upper GI endoscope, once you do a upper GI endoscopy, on the upper GI endoscopy, my dear students, what you can see, what you are supposed to do, upper GI endoscopy, along with that, you are supposed to do a biopsy. You are supposed to do a biopsy. So, where exactly you are going to do the biopsy? So, what are the places you take the biopsy from? So, the first and most important, always take the biopsy from the antrum of the stomach because antrum is the favorite place for whom? For the helicobacter pylori residence. So, helicobacter pylori is like, this is my own house, like that it is sitting in the antrum. Now, also take from the ulcer site. Also take from the ulcer site. So, these are the two places. After that biopsy, you are going to go for staining. Okay. So, what is the staining which we are going to use? So, we are going to use a stain from microbiology. It is also a very important MCQ also. So, that is only called as, a, that is only called as a silver starry warthin stain. What is that called as? Silver starry warthin stain. Silver starry warthin stain which is going to be used for the staining of helicobacter pylori if you are going to go for for example you want to do a culture if you want to do a culture of this bacteria then you are supposed to usually preferred one is a chocolate agar what is that chocolate agar so this is the investigation but earlier we also did and very uh, this is also a possible earlier it used to be said as a gold standard investigation we also do something called as a c urea breath test what is that called as c urea breath test okay so these are the possible investigations which can be done for helicobacter pylori okay so once you diagnose the helicobacter pylori the treatment for the helicobacter pylori right now preferred treatment is your what is that triple therapy what is triple therapy coming Comment down in the comment section. Okay. Triple therapy. So let's see how many of you know triple therapy. So that is your triple therapy. So triple therapy consists of three drugs. Okay. So triple therapy consists of three drugs that is your that is given for 14 days, or we can go for eradication therapy for 10 days. Usually, right now, triple therapy. If triple therapy, for example, if it fails, if it fails, then you are going to go for a quadruple therapy. What is that? Quadruple therapy. So, this is the story of your helicobacter pylori. Alright. Thank you. Keep following for more.